Today we're going to look at a pretty cool integral that I found on the math stack exchange. So our final goal is to find the limit as n goes to infinity of 1 over 1 plus the absolute value of a sine of nx and then all of that is squared. And what we'll do here is use a result which is sometimes called the riemann lebesgue lemma, but it goes like this. And this is actually like a simplified version of it where we're only looking at like really nice functions. So if g of x is a smooth function with a period of p, then if we take the limit as n goes to infinity of a to b of f of x times g evaluated at nx, we get 1 over p, and then the integral from a to b of f of x times the integral from 0 to p of g of x. And well, notice that our setup up here is exactly this, where f of x is simply the constant function 1, then g of x is that whole thing there, well, without the nx, with just an x there. And let's see, the period in this case is pi. You might say that it's 2 pi, but it's in fact pi, and that's because we have an absolute value there. And the period of the absolute value of the sine function is pi. Okay, so let's see how we're going to approach this lemma. So let's start here with what we're taking the limit of. So we have our integral from a to b of f of x times g of n times x dx. And what we'll do right here is we'll add and subtract the same thing. In other words, we're going to add the number 0, and it's going to be in this form. So we'll have the integral from a to b of f of x times, then we'll have g of nx here, and then I'm going to subtract 1 over p times the integral from 0 to p of g of t dt, and then I'm going to add that back in. So 1 over p, and then the integral from 0 to p of g of t dt. Okay, so that's good. And now I'm going to split this into parts. So the first part I'm going to split this into will be, let's see, attached to this right here. So distributing the f of x over to that. Oh, and I should point out that this is all dt. But observe that with respect to x, that integral from 0 to p of g of t dt is a constant, so we can factor it out. And in fact, we can factor it out and we'll have the integral from a to b times 1 over p of f of x dx times the integral from 0 to p of g of, I'm going to leave this as t dt, but let's observe that that's exactly what we're gunning for at the end here. Now I've got to take uh, whatever I have left. And what will that be? Well, I'm going to have this integral from a to b of f of x times, well, this new function right here, which perhaps I'll call g or h of x. So let's look at that right here. I'll call this, well, not h of x, but this will be h evaluated at n times x. So keeping that in mind, well, what is h of x? Well, observe that h of x will simply be equal to g of x minus the uh, 1 over p times the integral from 0 to p of g of t dt. And under this setup, if we take the integral from 0 to p of h of x dx, we simply get 0. Okay, so anyway, what I'll put here is this h evaluated at n times x dx. Okay, so now I'm going to bring some stuff down, and the stuff that I'm going to bring down is, well, our goal. So actually, let's maybe give some notation for this. Maybe we'll just say that this is goal, and we'll bring that down and write what the goal is, because that's what we should be left with. Everything else should cancel, like I, like I pointed out. Notice that this is with the n still in, but we'll see that as we take the limit, the rest of the stuff will approach zero. And let's see why that is. So I'm going to write this in kind of a crazy way. I'm going to write this as the integral from a to b of f of x, 
and then we'll have the integral from zero to x of, let's maybe write this as h prime of n times uh, t, and then we'll have a dt here and then a dx out here. But observe that I need to put a one over n here for this to like make sense. But now we're actually essentially done. And that's because if we look at this thing right here, we've got f of x, which is, well, it's an integrable function. I didn't say that like explicitly over here, but I think it's implicitly assumed. And then we've got this h function, which is smooth, which means its derivative is also smooth, meaning that that means that all of this right here is finite. And in particular, it's bound above. And I guess I'm being real hand wavy here because our main goal is this integral up here, which is going to require a little bit of work. But the kind of idea is this. So since g of x was periodic, h of x is also periodic. And that's because it differs from g of x just by a constant. But if a function is periodic, I think it's pretty clear that its derivative is periodic if everything makes sense, like the derivative makes sense. But then if you have a smooth function that's periodic, then, well, it's gonna have to have a, a maximum on its period. And so this is gonna be bound above by that maximum times, perhaps like something like the length of the interval. But then we've got this one over n here, which as n approaches infinity, will just get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. So that means in the conglomerate, all of this is going to approach zero. But that means that our object right here approaches this thing that I called the goal, which is of course this right-hand side of um, the final statement in our lemma. Okay, so now let's see how we can use this lemma to evaluate our goal. Okay, so uh, again, we're now going to use our lemma to evaluate our limit of an integral. And notice that in this case, the entire function inside is the g of n x function. And then, well, the function f is simply the number one here. And then integrating from zero to one is like integrating from a to b in, well, the general setup. So that means, well, what are we gonna have here? This is gonna be equal to one over pi because as we discussed before, the period of the absolute value of sine will be pi. That, thus, the period of that function is pi. And then we'll have the integral from zero to one of one, which is simply one. And then we'll have the integral from zero to pi of, let's see, it's gonna be one plus the absolute value of sine of x, and then all of that squared. And that's in the denominator. But notice that between zero and pi, the sine function is in fact a positive function. So we don't actually need that absolute value anymore, which is pretty sweet. And now what we'll do is something called the Weierstrass substitution. In other words, half angle tangent substitution. So I won't go through exactly how all of these things follow. I think I've done that in a previous video and this is on the internet in a lot of different places. But what we'll do here is set the tangent of x over two equal to t. And then what we get out of that is that, well, first of all, we see that, let's see, x is equal to two times the arctan of t, which means that dx is two dt over one plus t squared. So the dx component is like kind of easy, if you will. And then, well, sine and cosine are a little bit trickier, but what we get for sine of x is two over one plus t squared. Sorry, that should be two t over one plus t squared. Okay, so plugging that up here, we're gonna have the following. So we'll have a two over pi. I'll take this two and bring it out front and then we'll have an integral. We'll talk about the bounds of integration in just a second. And then let's see, in the denominator, we'll have a one plus t squared, and that's occurring from this, uh, let's see, dx component. And then after that, we'll have a one plus, let's see, it'll be two t over one plus t squared, all squared. And then let's see, we'll have a dt up here. And then let's see the bounds of integration. 
So when x is zero, tangent of zero is zero, so we get t is zero. And then as x approaches pi from below, we'll notice this tangent is gonna approach, well, kind of tangent of pi over two, if you will, from below, which is infinite. So that's the infinite limit of tangent as you approach pi over two from below. Okay, so now what we'll do is the following. So now we'll do the following. So we'll have two over pi integral from zero to infinity. And then let's see, we'll have a one plus t squared. And then that's gonna be over one plus t squared squared. And you might say, well, where did that come from? Well, that came from factoring this one plus t squared out of the denominator here. But that's gonna leave me with a one plus t squared plus two t um, all squared, just from the factorization. Now, let's see how that simplifies. So we'll have a two over pi, that's still out front, integral from zero to infinity. This one over t squared over one over t squared squared is gonna flip up to a one plus t squared in the numerator. And then now observe that this is simply t plus one to the fourth power. And then we have dt there. And now at this stage, I'm gonna do a bit of a substitution, which is gonna simplify our final calculation. And that substitution is gonna go like this. I'm gonna set x equal to t plus one. I'll reuse x since we're done with it after a couple of, uh, from a couple of steps before. Okay, so if x is t plus one, notice that t is x minus one. And then dx is equal to dt. So how is that gonna change our integral? So now we'll have two over pi, and now it'll be the integral from one to infinity, because we're changing our t values to x values. And let's see, here we have t squared plus one, which now is x minus one squared plus one over, now this turns into x to the fourth dx. Okay, but now uh, check it out. We get some nice simplification in this numerator. This multiplies out to x squared minus 2x plus 2. And then in the end, we'll have that this is 2 over pi integral from 0 to infinity of, let's see, it'll be 1 over x squared, and then minus 2 over x cubed, and then finally plus 2 over x to the fourth, and then let's see, dx. And this should have been from one to infinity. But now we can take the antiderivative of all of those parts and then we're essentially home free. So let's see, the antiderivative of this part will give us minus one over x. And then this is gonna end up giving us plus one over x squared. And then finally minus, let's see, that's gonna be two over three times x cubed. Okay, cool. Then we need to evaluate that from one to infinity. But what I'm gonna do is change all of these signs and evaluate it from infinity to one. And that's because evaluating at infinity will give you zero in all of those cases. And then plugging in one, we don't have to worry about a hanging minus sign. Now plugging one here, this cancels. Here we get two thirds. But then we've got two over pi times two thirds, giving us four over three times pi. And there we have it. That's the final value of the limit of our integral.